and welcome back today we're reading hellblazer number five and just a little catch up on what's been going on in the last couple issues in the last issue we saw john's niece named Gemma go missing and almost get killed by a child serial killer that had been killing people in the name of the damnation army we don't really know who they are yet but we just know that something bad is brewing in the background from them we also saw that Gemma's parents were part of some crazy christian cult called the resurrection crusade and they are going around as well. There's some sort of Christian pyramid scheme where you can pay money and your prayers will get sent up the prayer chain to the top eventually. And then hopefully those prayers will be heard by God. We were also introduced to a new character named Zed a couple issues back. And she and John have been having a slightly romantic relationship. She actually helped John get Gemma back from the serial killer in the last issue because John can't really fight. So she ended up taking out the serial killer for John. And we left the last issue with John and Zed in a motel room. Gemma was safe now, and John was looking at her in the bathroom mirror as she undressed to see if she had any Damnation Army tattoos. So first things first, with Hellblazer number five, we got the cover. We see what looks like a Vietnam war landscape because there's soldiers. There's a heavy sun in the background. We see helicopters. It looks like there's a woman who's putting her hands up to shield her face as someone's going to attack her. And then in the bottom, we can see the eyes of John Constantine watching all this. And this issue was written by Jamie Delano with art by John Ridgway. And before we get started, I do want you guys to know that this issue is particularly violent and messed up in my mind, at least. It deals with concepts of PTSD and war trauma, along with war crimes against Vietnamese people and women. And because a lot of this deals with soldiers in Vietnam fighting the Vietnamese, there is some racist language, but I'm not going to say that. I'll let you know when I change the words. But I wanted to give you all a heads up because this one is pretty intense. I think it's the most intense to me. I know the last one was pretty messed up, but this one is even more messed up to me. So with that being said, we start off on the first page where we get some text that says it is August 10th, 1968 in the Quang Tri province of Vietnam. And we see some Marines marching through the jungles of Vietnam. And the narration says, up, two, three, four, I love the Marine Corps. Lieutenant Frank Ross can't stop the moronic cadence marching through his head. They're eight hours into this crapped out mission, and he's had a gutful. Hup, two. Depenetration, they called it. Ha! It was them lard ashes at the division that needed penetration. Three, four. How many shades of green in one stinking jungle? How many Vietnamese eyes squinting down carbines? I love the Marine Corps. Sweat. Viscous as slobber dribbles into his eyes so that he can't see the trip wires, the pangy sticks. The heat is alive. It smothers him with its breathless body, raping his skin with a needle-barbed tongue. A sudden rustling in the green has the unit wriggling to bury themselves like toads. And the man in front yells out, Ambush! And all the soldiers that are with them begin to fire their M16s into the jungle. And the narration continues. Again invisible movement, closer. Skin tightens to receive the love bites of bullets. It's Craig Anders who breaks the tension, his M16 coming savagely into the hot, dense air, triggering the other weapons to flail the trees with their laden ejaculations. Then we cut from that scene to August 10th, 1987, so it's been 19 years since that scene we were just in, in Liberty, Iowa. And this place looks pretty desolate. There seems to be a single road passing between a couple different cornfields. And we see a man is hanging a sign that says, Liberty welcomes home her boys. So as the man hangs this sign, the narration says, No wind today. The corn stands stock still, waiting. There'll be storms soon. Over on the interstate, soft tires peel from hot tar like sticking plaster. The world passes by at a distance, fluttering Willie Anders' heart with a familiar anger. It was that damn road that killed Liberty. First, it starved the town of traffic and trade, then took off their sons to the war to be lost, missing in action. Daughters, abandoned by the future, left on the bus or in strange men's cars. The dwindling population of Liberty grew old with no grandchildren to envy. But in their hearts, they always kept faith with their boys. They have waited and prayed, and now something is happening. The Resurrection Crusaders were right. The Lord has taken charge. The government sure as hell hasn't helped. 
but the prayers have. All the cheated parents of liberty feel it. Soon they will rejoice. The lost sons of liberty are coming home from the war. Then we see that man named Willie who was hanging up the sign that says Liberty welcomes her boys home. Uh, here's something in the corn stalks, and he goes to check it out. And the narration continues. Something is moving in the corn. Strong stalks part like a bamboo curtain. And then we see Willie call out to the corn, Son, is that you? And as he says this, he's parting the corn as he walks into the field. But then all of a sudden, the corn ends and opens up into a Vietnamese village that is getting bombed by napalm. And as Willie says the word you, he is shot by an American soldier. And it's not just any American soldier, it's actually Craig Anders from the first page who was in that unit that was going through Vietnam. And he was the one who heard the noise in the bushes and started firing. So it seems something's going on with time and dimensions like inside this cornfield he walked through and ended up in Vietnam in the past. And we see the name of this issue is When Johnny Comes Marching Home. As we turn the page, we cut back to the scene where Craig Anders in Vietnam was shooting wildly at something in the jungle. And when the shooting stops, he moves forward to see what was moving, and they find an old Vietnamese man, and the narration says, A brief passion spent. There is a moment when silence drips like syrup from broken ends of branches. It's just one old Vietnamese. Anders' burst just about cut him in half. And then as Craig pushes the man's body over with his foot, the narration says, don't look like Charlie. Still, the brass say, if it's yellow and dead, it's the enemy. Better get moving before the real VC start pitching in mortars. Then we see the leader of this unit yell, okay, boys, move out. Nice shooting, Anders. Chalk up another one for the boys from Liberty. And you might not have caught it, but as Craig Anders pushed over the man's body, it said, it doesn't look like Charlie. And he's got a weird look on his face. And one of the other men says, what's the matter, man? You look like you woke up and found yourself humping your granny. And Craig says, huh? Oh, nothing, sir. Must be the goddamn heat, I guess. For a second, he looked just like my pop. It's just shadows or something. Then the leader turns to Craig and says, you've been smoking that louse grass again? Get a grip, boy. Take another look. I know your old man. He ain't no Vietnamese. He's an American, just like you and me. Now haul ass, you dumb grunt. We got a war to fight. And reload that weapon, soldier. And then we get narration that says, Hup two three four i love the marine corps so pretty much whenever these soldiers talk about vietnamese people they're using derogatory or racist language so whenever i say vietnamese as they're speaking they don't say that they actually say the racist words but i just wanted you to know in case you do pick up this issue later on and i don't want you to be surprised then we cut back to current day 1987 in liberty iowa and we see a gas station that is called the liberty corner and the narration says Alone in his dugout by the side of the interstate, Frank Ross sits, war flickering through his head like the passing traffic. It's that time of year again, when the heat sweats the black memories, twitching them restlessly in their body bags. He takes comfort from a cold glass bottle. Liquor blurs the parade of dead faces. Nearly 20 summers he's been through this. This year's the worst. So we see the man who was the leader of that unit, except now he is older and much heavier and balding. And he's drinking a bunch of alcohol as he sits in this gas station. And the narration continues. Since the old folks over in Liberty Hill had gotten all fired up with that holy roller crap, he'd had no peace from the war. He wishes they'd all have coronaries in the corn, like Nancy's pa. Their lives were knives twisting in his gut. They hated him because he'd come back, and their sons hadn't. Because he made a living out on the interstate, and they didn't. Christ, if they only knew. And Nancy... She ought to be back by now. What if she ever found out the truth about Frank Ross, the war hero? After a while, the heat distracts him. He forgets to drink and, sure as shooting, the parade of faces marches him back to Nam. So he begins to have memories of his fellow soldiers that all died in Vietnam in 1968. And he also has a flash of a Vietnamese woman who looks very scared as the muzzle of Frank Ross's rifle is pointed at her face. Then we see a Greyhound style bus stop in front of the gas station and John Constantine exits the bus and walks into the gas station store. And as he does this, his narration says, the sky here is too big. It's hot. Oppressive weight presses over the flattened ground, squeezing the road out of the horizon like toothpaste. I'm only supposed to be in the States for a quick visit to check up on the swamp thing. But I had read in the Inquirer about the resurrection crusaders in this town. 
where the people refused to give up hope for their missing in action sons. 19 years ago today, the unit went missing, and the bus went right past the town. You can't ignore coincidences, can you? Real magic doesn't advertise. Liberty's a couple miles off the interstate. If I've got to walk, I'm going to need a drink. So John walks into the gas station store, and he sees Frank Ross on the counter passed out, and the narration continues. Two decades and a half a world away, Lieutenant Ross crouches in the filthy pig run of his memory and waits for Charlie to find him. His world shakes with a furious fear of war. The VC are closing in. He prays for deliverance. Where are the planes? A shadow falls across him. And then we hear John say, Hello, mate. Any chance of a cold? But John speaking actually stirs Ross from his sleep, and he's still having his flashback. So he pulls out his pistol, and he begins firing at John Constantine. And luckily, John is quick on his feet because he's able to jump out of the way. But Frank Ross is still in his flashback mode, and he goes straight up to John, and he's about to pull the trigger as he puts the gun right in John's face. And the narration says, The guy's eyes tell me there's no point in talking. I savor the taste of the gun. Such things are a rare experience. And then Frank says to John, Here's yours, you Vietnamese bitch! But luckily for John... Nancy, Frank's wife, comes in and sees this and yells out before he can shoot, Frank, no, don't! And this seems to wake Frank from his flashback, and the narration says, The cold, oiled metal slips from my lips. Patiently I wait for my heart to start beating again. And as Frank comes to, he says, Nancy? And then Nancy takes the gun out of Frank's hands, and then she turns to John and says, Jesus God, mister, what can I say? Just stay put while I get him to bed. Come on, baby. Mama's got you. And then she brings Frank into a back room, and she says to him, Honey, I've got to go back. Pa ain't even buried yet. Ma needs me. So this woman is actually Nancy Anders, who is the sister of Craig Anders, who died in Vietnam, and the man Willie Anders, who died at the beginning of this issue when there was the weird time event and he got shot by his own son in Vietnam. So she's trying to deal with her PTSD husband and also her dad dying and her mom needing help with that. But Frank doesn't really understand, and he says to her, What about me? I don't want to be on my own either. You know what day it is. And she replies, Come with me, Frank. They're all crazy in the town, utterly convinced that the Pyramid of Prayers is going to bring the boys back. It's scary. And we see in the back of this panel that uh, John is kind of followed to see what's going on with Frank, and he's standing in the doorway and listening in on what they're saying to each other. And he perks up as she says something about the Pyramid of Prayers, because... I believe John heard someone talk about that in the last issue in regards to the Resurrection Crusaders. So John's narration says, I should go, now, but it's too late. I'm already plugged into the claustrophobic horror of these people's private lives. So John walks outside and he waits by the truck that Nancy drove up in, and his narration says, Claustrophobia inside, agoraphobia out. Should be able to blag a lift to Liberty, though. She's bound to feel obliged. And as he thinks this, Nancy walks out of the building and sees John standing by her truck, and she says, I'm real sorry, mister. Frank was wounded in the war. Got a purple heart, but he came home a bit crazy. What's your problem anyway? Car broke down? And John says, Nah, it's a bit bloody silly, really. I got off the bus to take a pee, and they went without me. Is there a motel in Liberty? I'd hitch it, but I'm a bit shook up like. And Nancy replies, Well, sort of. Don't get many visitors since the interstate came by. My ma owns it. And John answers, sounds perfect. So they get in the car and they begin to drive to Liberty. And Nancy says to John, I suppose it's the least I can do. But I warn you, the folks are a bit strange just now. They all lost their kin in the war, missing in action. Now this TV preacher says he's going to pray to bring them back. He's got them psyched up like a football coach. It's going to be ma's heart when nothing happens. And then John looks out at the sky through the window and his narration says, Overhead, ominous thunderheads gather like tumors. And then we see the truck pulling up to a house that says motel on the front of it. And John says to Nancy, So you're sure about this? And Nancy says, Yeah, why not? And then John's narration says, It's here, all right. You can feel it. Bulbous, bloating, the irresistible tension, the promise of emotional lightning. And then we cut to John getting into his room at the motel, and his narration says, the motel cabin is like a set from Psycho. And then we see him get his cigarettes and go outside to smoke, and the narration continues. The whole of Liberty is a 20th century ghost town, 
All that's missing is the tumbleweed. This may be the right place, but it feels like the wrong time. And then John decides to walk towards the main house. And as he does, we hear some voices coming out of it. And we hear an old woman say, Today's the day. Your brother won't be missing his paws burying. Craig will be back by morning. You'll see, girl. We're the top of the pyramid tonight. God's eye is on us. He's going to put things right. And as John hears this, his narration says, Whatever is brewing here, I'm not going to be able to stop it. And then he passes by the window of the house and we see the body of Willie, the old man that died at the beginning, is in a coffin in this main room. And the old woman is talking to Nancy. And Nancy says to her, Please, Ma, it scares me when you talk this way. It's been 20 years. You've got to accept it. They ain't never coming back. And at that, the old woman slaps Nancy across the face and says, Shut your lying face, you traitor slut. It's all right for you, living down there on the interstate. Frank Ross came home. And John kind of stops and watches this, and his narration says, It's grown too fat. Now it's ripe to spill its guts all over Liberty. I'm just a neutral observer, or maybe a voyeur would be more accurate. Families, uh, who needs them? Then we cut to the house of Frank Ross, the guy from the gas station who has PTSD, and he is asleep having bad dreams about Vietnam again. And we get this really well-designed page that uh, basically has one side of it is Frank in Vietnam and one side is Frank nowadays. And he's doing the same things because I believe he is having a PTSD flashback at this exact moment. So there's a panel of him waking up in the jungle and then there's a panel of him waking up in his bedroom. And the one in the jungle has the narration that says, vulnerable, exposed to death in all its cruel indignity, squatting half naked alone in hostile jungle. Only a fool wouldn't be afraid. Ross is scared, all right, but a combination of pre-combat nerves and dysentery are a pretty strong incentive. Then we see Frank wake and sit up in the current day, 1987, and his narration says, It's time. Time to end it. Jolted awake from a hot black sauna nightmare, the old familiar fear coils tightening, a parasite scourging his intestine. Then we cut back to Vietnam, and he is getting ready. He's putting on his battle gear, and the narration says, His fear throbs like a boil which can only be lanced by violence. Existence in Nam is a cycle of boredom, fear, and violence. Then we get an image in the present day where he's basically doing the same thing. He's putting on whatever battle gear he has left over from Vietnam in his house. Uh, so we're seeing him putting on like his belt with the pouches and stuff. We see he's got a pistol and his narration says, He knows suddenly that it is true. Without a shadow of a doubt, the boys are out there waiting for him. The old combat fatigues are tight, hot, and restrictive. But the weapon is cool. Its weight gives authority to his purpose. Then we cut back to him in Vietnam walking through the jungles. And the narration says, It wears a man out. Makes him old. Till death is only a long promised climax waiting to be fulfilled. Just ahead, the unit waits for him to lead the assault on the suspect Hamlet. Then we see present day Frank walking out of his house with his battle gear on. Whatever was able to fit on him and his M16. And the narration says, Frank Ross slips out into the secretive corn. He knows where they'll be, poised like sudden death to fall upon the target. He knows. He's been there before. Then we come back to Vietnam where he finds his unit, and they are getting ready to attack a small village in Vietnam. And the narration says, He finds them. They look like men who've marched nine hours through hell, hunkered down around their weapons. They could be asleep or dead. Ross knows that they are neither. His wide eyes flash from ashen faces as his arrival ropes in their tethered minds. Anders rouses them. Then we see Frank Ross ask Craig Anders in a whisper, What's the target status? And Anders answers, Just another bunch of crummy huts. Seems quiet. Few old folks, no sign of Charlie. And the narration says, Most times in Nam, you don't see Charlie lest he's dead. Then Ross turns back to his men and says, Okay, we move in and search. Shoot the place up a bit and round up all the locals. Anybody runs, blow them away. They must have a guilty conscience. So the men begin to move towards the Vietnamese town quietly, and the narration says, Frank Ross knows all about guilt and retribution. He leads them from the concealing cloak of vegetation. This time, he won't let them down. This time, he'll stay with them. 
this time he'll choose death and liberty. And then we see modern day Frank Ross, who's all fat and everything and out of shape, leading his men from the cornfields into Liberty, Iowa. So he's having like a flashback of the moment in Vietnam when he should have died and everybody else did, but this time he's making it right. And there's some supernatural thing going on where the boys are coming home and they're recreating the attack on this village, but he doesn't realize it is Liberty, their hometown that they're attacking. Then we cut to the inside of the hotel where in, I guess in like the common area living room, there's a TV and a bunch of old people from town are sitting there and watching it. And there's a preacher on it that says, Lord, hear us as we cry to thee, brothers and sisters of the resurrection crusade, love the Lord and he'll love you. And the old people watching are saying, hear us, Lord, hallelujah, bring them back. And the narration says, the atmosphere is electric. The aged congregation are at a fever pitch. I feel like I'm perched on the edge of an avalanche. Then we see behind the old people, John and Nancy are leaning against a wall watching this scene. And John turns to Nancy and asks, um, I'm just a simple English boy. What's going on? And Nancy answers, it's the pyramid of prayer. You've got to pay 10 bucks a month and your prayer goes into the computer. Then you have to do these sort of chain letter scripture mailings. And as you get more people into the crusade, your prayer moves to the top of the pyramid. Then it gets on coast to coast TV. And then we hear the television continue saying, tonight we thrust Liberty, Iowa before the eye of the almighty. These worthy crusaders have paid their dues. Have you? On this day 19 years ago, their sons were snatched by the satanic hands of communism. And as they watch this, Nancy continues, they reckon it works miracles. The blind see, cripples walk, and the TV yells out, deliver them. And the old people watching are saying, look, they're here. It's the boys. Praise the Lord. And then John looks out the window, I guess just curious, and he actually sees the boys are walking towards the town. And he says to Nancy, uh-oh, how about raising the dead? And as the soldiers come into the house, they begin to shoot up the fan above the old people, and John immediately runs out of the room and doesn't even try to do anything to save anybody, and his narration says, I'm off. Then we cut to the flashback the soldiers are seeing. So if you didn't quite understand, basically what's going on is these boys are coming back from Vietnam, but they are just reliving the scene of their last battle where they attacked a small village in Vietnam, but they're reliving that in the modern day as they return so where they're seeing Vietnamese people running towards them or running away from them, it is actually in the real world, their family members and parents and stuff. So we see what the soldiers are seeing in Vietnam and they're seeing old people come out and look at them and kind of gawk at them. And the narration says, gunfire and yelling decimate the deep green quiet of dusk as Ross and his men blast them out of their hovels. No resistance. The grunts round up the sullen Vietnamese and fire the huts. Even as their homes burn, they show no emotion. And one of the soldiers says, the bastards ain't human. And the narration continues. Then one, a male, young enough to fight, breaks from the fire. Then Frank raises his gun and points it towards the Vietnamese boy who's running. And he says, ha, you're dead meat, Charlie. And just as he's about to pull the trigger, a hand comes out of nowhere of one of the locals and hits the gun away. And the narration says, the interruption is enough. The local boy vanishes into the trees. It's true, there ain't no civilians in this war. And then it turns out that the person who slapped the gun down uh, to stop Ross from firing on the boy was a Vietnamese woman from the village, and the narration continues. Ross looks at the girl. Why is she jabbering at him? He can't understand her. Nothing about her is familiar except her sex. Calmly, he slaps her across the face, reassured by the sight of her blood. Then we see the woman, after she recovers from being slapped, she gets very angry and the narration says, her expression is unreadable. A hard, cold anger of incomprehension stirs inside him. He is slipping into another world. Then we cut to reality in Liberty, Iowa, where it turns out that the person Frank actually was shooting at in reality wasn't a local Vietnamese boy running away, but it was actually John Constantine. And the woman who slapped the gun down was Nancy, not a local Vietnamese woman. Which also means that Frank backhanded Nancy and hit her away, which is why at the end when she's looking at him angrily, he's a little confused because he kind of sees glimpses of her in the Vietnamese woman, I think. So as John is getting shot at and luckily doesn't get shot because Nancy slaps the gun away, John's narration says, Bullets whisper my name off through the corn. I knew it was going to get heavy. 
but this is way out of order. Magic I can handle, but I don't like guns. Anyhow, it's not my bloody war, but in a way, I know it is. Vietnam was everybody's war. A movie fought nightly on TV in front rooms around the world. So it seems all the soldiers in the town have rounded up the old people and put them all in the center of the town and are making them kneel. And the old people don't understand what's going on. They're seeing the young versions of their children treating them like enemy combatants. And the old people are saying, but you're our children. Let her go. What are you doing? And then Craig Anders' mom looks up at Craig and says, please, Craig, I'm your mother. And then Frank Ross, who has Nancy by the hair, points his M16 at Craig's mother on the ground and shoots her. And the narration says, now the missing stars of that movie have come home. Trouble is, they brought the war back with them. Then Craig turns to Frank and says, geez, Lieutenant, you didn't have to. And Frank cuts in, I thought she had a grenade. Goddamn Vietnamese blather. You can't understand them. So all the soldiers can't understand their parents begging for their lives. They only see Vietnamese people and hear Vietnamese being spoken back to them. And as Frank says, you can't understand them. We see the older people saying, but we brought you back. We prayed for you. But because they can't understand them, they just ignore what these old people are saying. And now Frank, who has Nancy by the hair still, says to his men, move them out, Anders. Leave me the radio. I'll catch up to you at the LZ. There's something I got to do here. Then we see John's narration say, looks like I'm the one that got away. I only have to watch. So then we cut to what Frank Ross is seeing, and he is seeing him holding the Vietnamese woman that hit the gun out of his hand by the hair, and the narration says, suddenly exultant in the blazing night, scales peel from his eyes. Lieutenant, he communes with the gods of war. He has found some lost wild part of himself, caged by history, which now bends its bars and stretches its raw and bloody frame. The darkness isn't frightening once you surrender to it. In hell, after all, you should expect to find demons. So then Frank in Vietnam begins to attack the woman he was holding on to, and the narration says, The woman fights hard, but hopelessly. The darkness is undeniable. It's a passion that must be spent, a hunger that must be sated, a poison that must be drawn by a warm, soft poultice. And under this narration, we see Frank getting scratched by the fighting woman, and then he throws her to the ground, and he rapes her. Then we cut to John's point of view, where he's seeing what Frank is doing in reality, and Frank is actually attacking his wife, Nancy, not the Vietnamese woman. And John is in, like, the corn stalk, so he's kind of parting them slightly to look out and see this horrific scene. And his narration says, I suppose you could call it Vietnamerica, this place where the smoke boils luridly into the sky rising to maul the thunderheads with rough, obscene hands. And as Nancy tries to fight back against Frank, she's saying, Frank, stop it! Don't do this! You're insane! It's me, Nancy! And as John watches, his narration says, You should do something, Constantine. But there's nothing to be done. I'm shut out of this thing. No way I can go charging into their movie. It's too bloody dangerous. Too many hopes and fears refined into anger. Too much desperation distilled into violence. And as Frank begins to rape his wife, Nancy, John closes the corn because he does not want to see that. And his narration continues. As ruptured realities collapse and fold together into one, I drag a nest of straw around me and listen while thunder beats a climax to this corrupt passion play. Then we get to Nancy on the ground looking up at Frank with disgust and she's saying, You ain't a man, you're an animal! And then suddenly, a bolt of lightning actually crashes into the ground next to Frank, and the narration says, Then, violence discharged, lightning photographs him, flat white breathless at the scene of the crime. He cowers from the world's loud condemnation. I watch him tremble as the fear creeps back. Then we cut to what Frank is seeing in Vietnam, and instead of lightning, it's actually munitions and mortars and stuff that are attacking the landing zone he just sent his men to. So just in case you're not following, this is what actually happened in Vietnam to his men and him. He stayed behind to rape a Vietnamese woman after his men burned the village, and they all died at the landing zone because it got attacked, and he survived because he was back at the village and he was going to meet them later. So the lightning that hit next to him is playing out as the attack on the landing zone where his men are. And the narration says, Ross tries to bury himself in filth from the direction of the landing zone, where the choppers are supposed to pick up the unit. 
Terror wild percussion beats out. Carbines rattle, mortars wobble the jello night, and the heavy machine gun stitches the jungle tapestry. The unit has walked into a hot LZ. Charlie's out there, lots of him. The boys are as good as dead already. Ross can't help them. He imagines the Vietnamese even now slipping around the trees like shadows, like alligators sliding through the rice paddy. If they catch him and find the girl, what will they do to him? But when you're an American, the cavalry sometimes comes. Then we see Frank get on the radio and he begins to call out for backup. And he's saying, this is bird one to chicken hot control. We have a hot LZ. Reference vector zero one Lima echo two alpha. Request napalm. Repeat, request napalm. And the narration continues. The words are a spell to summon a fire from the sky. American magic. Within minutes, a wedge of sound rends the dark canvas above him. But as he waits for the gasoline flowers to blossom, a shadow falls across Frank Ross. So as Frank is on the ground, this shadowy person is actually the woman that he just raped. And she is able to grab the pistol from his shoulder holster and then points it at Frank. Then we come back to reality and present day. And we see John is once again watching what's going on. And Nancy has done the same thing the Vietnamese woman did. She was able to remove the pistol from Frank's shoulder holster. And she's saying, I've got to kill you, Frank. I don't know what's happening, but I'm going to do it. And as John watches, his narration says, I should help her do the bastard, but I still can't move. At least that's what I tell myself. And Frank, who's still seeing his flashback, says to his wife, don't talk that monkey talk to me, slut. And then Frank begins to walk towards her. And as Nancy holds out the gun to him, she's definitely shaky and scared, obviously. And she says, it's not for me, Frank. It's for Ma and Pa and Craig. But Frank is still not understanding her. And he says, you'd better shoot me, whore. You can't talk me to death. So Nancy does just that. She pulls the trigger. But unfortunately, because she's so nervous, she actually only hits him in the leg and he's able to slap the gun out of her hand. And he still has his M16 in his hand. So he lifts that, points it right in her face and says, now here's yours, Vietnamese bitch. And as Frank pulls the trigger and kills his wife, John once again closes the corn before he sees it and he holds his head in his hands and his narration says, oh Christ, Jesus, but for a couple of hours that could have been me. That's cutting the deck too close to the ace of spades. If I knew what happened in Vietnam, this wouldn't be such a bloody mess. Then we cut away from Frank and we cut back to his unit that is still in the middle of the cornfield, but they are not seeing the corn. They are seeing Vietnam because this is still the flashback and they have brought their parents and relatives into the cornfield with them as prisoners thinking that they are Vietnamese from the village they attacked. So as they get to the landing zone, the narration says, Charlie was waiting for them. The freaking LZ is hotter in hell in a heat wave. Now Craig Anders knows they're going to get their asses shot off. Frank Ross screwed them, dropped them right in the, and the narration is cut off by an explosion that happens right next to Anders. And his narration says, damn Ross, where is he? Without the radio, they can't call up air support. The bastard Lieutenant had gotten weird on them. Anders should have seen it coming. He's known Ross a long time. They're hometown boys. The man's engaged to his sister, for Christ's sake. Now he's just watched him kill a geriatric citizen and rape an enemy prisoner. And then one of the other men yells out, Anders, what are we going to do? And Anders yells back, Well, we're Marines, so I guess we got to fight. And the narration continues. But nothing that happens here could have any meaning at home in Iowa, in America. Over the sound of the firefights, the roar of the approaching planes is no more than the sighing of wind. Then we cut away from the unit in Vietnam and we cut back to Frank in present day as he's looking up at the sky. And the narration says, Frank Ross looks up into the desolate sky and finds himself alone in the empty heart of America. Fever has wrung him dry. Exhaustion burdens him with the weight of planets. He is lost and blood drips from his fingers. He finds his wife. So Frank is woken up from the flashback and he finds Nancy dead on the ground in front of him. And he says, N Nancy. And then he begins to vomit next to her as he realizes what he's done and the narration continues. But her face is a mask concealing the unspeakable terror of the void. Frank Ross throws up over the edge of the world. It's happening again. The unit had come back and gone again without him. He still lives while the war devours everything around. And then Frank stands up and begins screaming into the sky and the narration says, 
Guilt and desire wrench sobs like deformed children from his belly. Not for him. The fire and pain. His hell is here on Earth. And as Frank shakes his fists into the air, he says, Why don't you take me too? And then at this exact moment, we see John Constantine appear out of the corn behind Frank and begins barking orders like he's in the military at Frank saying, It's no good bawling about it, soldier. You'd better shape up. You're an officer. And Frank just kind of hears this and stares forward like he's under some kind of spell and the narration says, The drill sergeant's tone whips his mind to order. And then John barks some more, Pick up that weapon. Get with your unit. You're a Marine. You've got to fight if you want to die. So Frank listens to his orders, and he picks up his M16, and then he begins to walk into the corn. And the narration says, Ross vanishes into the corn. Perhaps I shouldn't have butted in, but he looked like he needed a prompt. I follow more slowly. The ending's bound to be bad, but I can't miss it. So John follows Frank, but he doesn't follow him all the way. He actually gets on some sort of sky bridge that goes across the interstate and it gives him a view of the gas station that all this started at and he can see the ghost soldiers have rounded up all the old people from the town and they're making them kneel in front of them and john's narration says traffic sounds light on the interstate just a truck in the distance or is it a plane hard to tell above the wind from up on the bridge i can see it all start to happen the ghost marines crouched on the forecourt the old folks huddled, dazed. And then John watches as a semi-truck comes down the road towards him, and Frank actually steps right out in front of it, and he's saying, Up, two, three, four, I love the Marine Corps. And then he begins to fire his M16 at the truck as it bears down on him. And John's narration says, The lights of the truck, and Ross stepping from the corn. And as we turn the page, we get another one of those pages that shows the intercutting of what's happening in Vietnam and what's happening in 1987 in reality. So we're seeing the truck is the sound of the airplane that the soldiers were hearing at the landing zone, and those planes begin to drop their napalm on the landing zone. Because if you remember, that's where Frank had called it in. And John's narration says, Poor old sods. Never had a chance. It was an accident waiting to happen. A hammer waiting to drop. So the airplane drops its napalm payload, and then we see the tandem panel that is what's going on in reality. And because Frank has shot at the truck, uh, it has swerved violently because either the guy's dead that was driving it or he's trying to get away from Frank. But either way, the truck turns and it heads straight towards the gas station where the ghost Marines have the old people from the town prisoner. Then we cut back to the Vietnam flashback and we see the napalm has dropped and all the old people and soldiers are running in fear as the bombs pepper the ground. And then back to reality, the truck overturns and we see the semi truck, which just happens to be transporting gasoline as well, crashes down on its side because the turn was too steep and it bursts into flames along with everything at the gas station. And then both scenes kind of come together with the explosions from the bomb and the explosion from the truck and the fire killing everybody at the landing zone and at the gas station. And over these panels, John's narration says something to do with the place, the people. Bitterness and blind faith, with a shot of guilt for a catalyst. A cancer that had been growing for a long time, just waiting for the resurrection crusade to kick it awake. Split the temporal fabric at the tension point, or something. How the hell should I know? One thing is sure, I've got to get on these crusaders case soon. And then John says out loud, Christ, what a bloody awful mess. And then as he watches the gas station burn, the narration says, Vietnam America drowns in fire. Before, I'd only seen the war. Now I know how it smells. It smells of gasoline. Then we cut to sometime in the next couple days, and we see John is in the center of a town, and he's just gotten a ride from someone he hitchhiked from, and his narration says, I'm not interested in the body count. I leave before the final credits roll. 200 miles away in dog shit Nebraska, or someplace. Like all the other some places scattered across this giant farm, my lift runs out. So John begins to walk through this small town in Nebraska and he's walking down the main street and he sees a gun store and a bunch of video rental stores that have posters for movies like Platoon, Hamburger Hill, Full Metal Jacket, and there's even a banner that says, films that show how it really was. And John reads that and says, hmm, I doubt it. And over these panels, his narration is saying, I feel like a veteran, just back from the war zone, thrust into a strange, unreal world. 
Hell's a mirror this place hasn't looked into yet. Then as John continues walking, he sees a family loading some groceries into a car, and there's a man in a wheelchair that's sitting next to them, and he doesn't have any arms. And the narration says, Then I see the guy by the car. Catch the pain and fear in his eyes as his wife fusses the kids and shopping inside. He wants to help her. He could tell them. And as John walks by, the man turns and sees him, and John's narration says, I flash a peace sign at him. Then I feel stupid because he's got no way to return it. I turn my back and walk away. And as the man watches John walk away from him, John's narration says, Hup, two, three, four. I love the Marine Corps. I know this. Sometime while the war visited Liberty, I stopped being an observer and became a witness. I've got the evidence. Now where's the court? And that is the end of the issue. So it seems John is now going to turn his attention to the Resurrection Crusade now that he's actually seen what damage they can do. So we'll see how he does that in the next issue. So if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And we will see you on the next one.